Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Ellis. I'm a psychologist, psychotherapist, Buddhist scholar, and uh, I have running some sort of a series where I introduce a connection between original Buddhism and psychology and psychotherapy. Now in previous episodes, I focused on two interesting aspects uh, in that intersection. One was ethical conduct as the basis for regaining a healthy intuition and feeling of self. And the second is that I focused on the machine aspect of being a human being. Um, and I introduced the basic concept, very fundamental concept in Buddhism, that it basically wants us to enhance our possibilities, our degrees of freedom the degrees of freedom so that we move away from being a machine that is always doing the same thing in a habitual way, in a very predictable way, and allows us to choose. To choose what? To choose to do the right thing in important situations, good for us, good for others, and healthy and more and more healthy in a subtle way for our own mind. Now, there is a three-step development in Buddhism, which is overly simple because there are many steps in between, but it's still good as a crutch to keep in mind what the progression in Buddhist development looks like. The first is ethical conduct. This is what I focused on in the episode on intuition and feeling of self. Then we have the step of Samadhi meditation. The third one is Panya, which is wisdom and allows us to really free our mind in a very fundamental way. Today, I want to focus on an in-between step between the ethical conduct, the ethical purification, and before we, in a very normative, normal way, sit down to meditate. So we are just before meditation, and we are doing this pre-meditation step when I say we, I mean Buddhism and Buddhist development, in order to prepare us for meditation. A very important aspect of the preparation was the ethical purification. Already with a process, with an enduring, endured process of ethical purification, we can pacify our mind, we can purify our mind, purify our mind and let emerge spontaneous good feelings, peacefulness, and so forth. Today, I want to talk about the following steps on the Buddhist path. And those steps are the mindfulness of sensory perceptions on the one hand, and the mindfulness of body feeling on the other. And it's important to emphasize that even though it sounds very meditative, this is before we formally sit down to meditate. Okay, let's look at the first step, the mindfulness of sensory perceptions. Now, many of you might already associate the term mindfulness with more formal meditation practice. And yes, the same term in Pali, sati, which is usually translated as mindfulness, appears later on in more advanced vipassana or insight meditation aspects and even in normal samadhi samatha meditation practice and yet this term appears also before formal meditation here in this context of the mindfulness of sensory perceptions so what is meant with that what it means is that we learn in situations to focus on the pure aspect of our sensory perception when i see something not to see a door but to see a shape, to see a color, to see patterns, to see reflections, to, do, to see those very fundamental aspects of the cognitive process. When I hear not to hear a dog barking, not to hear a car, but to hear a swelling of the sound, a harshness, a frequency, a tone, a harmony, disharmony. So a very basic 
processing that is not yet developed into the recognition of an object. We do this recognizing, this categorizing, with this identifying in a very unconscious way. It's only in some contexts that we become witnesses of what the mind is actually doing, which is, for example, in situations when what we perceive is ambivalent, when we don't fully understand what the sound is, but at the same time, we deem it important to understand what it is, when we are in a twilight situation and we're a little bit anxious when we move forward, we see shapes, we see something moving, and it is of vital importance for us to identify if this is a random movement of leaves, or if this is an animal, if this is a human, or a human standing somewhere, or if this is a pillar. Uh, and then the mind flips between identifying you know, the pillar or the human to, to see an animal moving or just leaves on the ground moving. So then we become aware of it, conscious of it. Usually we're not conscious of it at all. Usually this happens without our asking. The identification of the object pops up in our mind and we are not given the opportunity to interfere, to stop, to change, to question this process. And yet, what is practice asks us to do that exactly. To understand what is the process of cognition, not in a philosophical way, but just to be able to perceive the components that then are put into more complex processing computations by the mind. So when I touch something, for example, when I touch my hands, not to let the image, the mental image of a hand come up, but rather to stay put, to stop the cognition process by recognizing that there is a softness, there is a hardness, there is a pattern there, there is a certain temperature there, the most fundamental building blocks of our con cognition. Now, now, why would that be important in the Buddhist process? When we ask ourselves, when was it that I, as an individual organism, or when we, as humans, build the skills of identifying and further processing objects, human beings, and so on. It goes very far back into our development as humans. Babies already when they come out of the womb are using cognition as building blocks. This is what then, you know, the basic conditioning of uh, the newborn builds on to be able to recognize a voice, a touch, the face of the mother, the touch of the mother's breast, the tone of the father, and so on. Very fundamental things, for example, touch, of course, touch, but also sight, babies are able to do from the first days on. And we build on top of that. Everything that follows is built on the very primary central cognitive perce perceptions. But why does it still make sense in the context of a Buddhist development to go back to that very primary state of mental development? Because our development took place in a very different context. Babies are not free. They are driven. They are very helpless. They acutely depend upon identifying, for example, parents, for identifying something that might be hurtful. And they are in, they are thrown into, they are born into a world that they don't understand. And they are not just, you know, abstract observers, curious, oh, it doesn't matter if I recognize something or not. No, it's of vital importance. And uh, we might not see it on the 
facial expressions and so on of the babies. But later on, when they can articulate, when they can move, we see how much urgency there is in children to understand the environment, to learn to manipulate the environment, to process it on a more and more complex way. So when we go back to the level of purifying our very basic sensory experiences, we go back basically to a time, to a mode that has been, we can say from a Buddhist perspective, polluted by drives, by the forming and budding ego, by needs, and it was anything but free. Now as adults, we can do this exercise and we can hear without any afterthought, without any, without functionalizing what I'm hearing, without having to use this knowledge for anything. I can just listen. When I touch, I can just touch. I don't need to like it. I don't need to derive sensual pleasure out of it. I don't need to understand if I hate it, if I want to push it away. I can just let it be. So there is a stopping there. I stop myself from further processing. I keep it pure. I keep it simple. And this purity and the simplicity goes back to the very foundation of mind formation. I go back to the earliest stages, not in a narrative way, not in a symbolic way, not in a psychological way, but I go back to the basics to where narration, psychology, further processing comes from. I go back to the roots. So we can say that at the roots of the Buddhist mind development, we go back to the roots of the development of our mind to begin with. Okay, so I hope it makes sense for you to understand how much impact there is in this level, if we can actually do that in situations where we don't need the full processing power of our mind, when we go along our daily activities, when we walk, when we stand, we listen to something, we sit on the bus, all those sensory experiences are there. I don't need to think about, let's assume it's not a situation where I need to figure something out, where I don't need to solve a problem. I just don't distract myself. I don't need to put on a podcast, music, watch a TikTok or a video or something. I don't need to do that. I can use this time for purification, for simplification. It's an exercise in stopping the mind from doing something habitual, something that comes under the influence of our drives, of our impulses, of our needs, all those complex aspects of, the, of our mind that creates problems for us in the long run. So I purify and see how I experience what it does to me, how it feels like, what it does to my system, when I just experience the basic building blocks of perception. Okay, the next step is the awareness of bodily feelings. And here I would like to, it's not a full quote, I simplified it a little bit, but this is basically coming from the oldest Buddhist scriptures. And it describes this practice, and I think it makes clear what it has in mind with this practice. It tells us to pay attention to the body, to be mindful when we walk, when we bend and stretch our limbs, when we eat, drink, chew, swallow, taste, when we move the body, when we walk, stand, sit, when we fall asleep, wake up, when we talk, when we remain silent. So if you pay attention to what aspects of body awareness this is mentioning, this is not the body experience of someone who just is still. These are movements. 
And movement is an aspect of the body that babies, toddlers, kids have to learn to take control of. So when we purify our vision of our bodily experience in movement, we are paying attention, we are mindful of the bodily functions that we had to acquire, that we had to learn. We had to learn to control. And for those of you who are a little bit versed in the history of psychology, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, you know that Freud, for example, paid a lot of attention to those so-called phases, the oral phase when children learn to control the swallowing function, the taste, the food, the lust of this process, the lust of the control of this, and the so-called anal phase, which is the period of time when small children learn to control their, uh, the system of defecating and peeing, to hold it back, to let it go, and so on. And he already rightly observed that those bodily functions, the control over bodily functions, is heavily conditioned by the surrounding parents, have been in the past, maybe this is changing now, but usually they're not completely neutral when it comes to that. They like it when the kid learns to control the bodily functions. The kid itself doesn't need to learn that it's good to crawl, that it's good to stand up, that it's good to walk, that it's good to run. It wants it by itself. And this is an expression of the basic helplessness that babies are born into. It cannot move, but it sees everyone else moving. Even animals are moving. Certainly the siblings, the parents, strangers, everyone can move. And the children see that the freedom of movement comes with many benefits. I can go away from a situation that I don't like. I can move towards a circumstance that I like. I can go and get my food. I can run away from heat, some oppressive situation. I can move away from a boring circumstance, a boring room that I'm in and so on. So this is an aspect that doesn't need to be taught. The kid wants to control its bodily functions basically, with or without the sanction of the surrounding, of the parenting. So again, we have here a good example of how the development of our mind, the development of taking control of our own body was not happening in an emotionally neutral space. It was heavily functionalized. I want to do this in order to get something, avoid something. I want to use my own bodily skill in order to achieve something. There was no space for neutral, introspective, meditative exploration there for toddlers and kids. They want to take control over themselves and the environment because they have to. So learning to control was not happening in a pure, clear environment context. This is what we can do. We as adults, as grown-ups, we can, can go back to a mode of our being, for example, the control of our physical functions, and we can observe that with interest, curiosity, openness, equanimity, neutrality, and thus purify something that we have been thrown into existentially at a, as a not pure experience. We can purify it now. So we can go back and to learn to purify our sensory experience, which is the most fundamental one. And as the next thing, we can go back to a field of our everyday life, our bodily experience, the control over our bodily functions, and purify that as well with curiosity, with neutrality, and to just experience that. And again, 
I read what we are recommended to pay attention to, to be mindful when we're walking, when we're bending and stretching our limbs, which is when we walk. When we walk, we move our joints, the knee, the foot, the hands, and so on. When we eat, drink, chew, swallow, when we move the body in walking, standing, sitting, when we fall asleep, when we wake up, which is already more of a mental thing, it leaves already the purely bodily realm. And lastly, when we talk and remain silent, which is also a more complex cognitive function than just the bodily movement. But this is what I want to focus on. We go back to something very fundamental to ourselves. This is not psychological, it's not narrative. This is pre-psychological. This is a stuff that is unconscious within us that we usually don't have access to. And as methodical as Buddhism is in its development, it points us to that. Bring, develop degrees of freedom in something that you have not even considered to bring degrees of freedom into, into the most unconscious stuff, the basic building blocks of our sensory perceptions, the basic building blocks of controlling our bodily functions. And this is what you can do in daily life, whether you want to just purify your experience on a more mundane self-care level, or if you really want to prep yourself further on to get into more formal meditation. And I can tell you from experience, the more you invest into these aspects, what I described before, the ethical correct conduct, conduct, the purification of our sensory experience, the purification of our bodily experience, the more you put into that, the easier and more natural the development in meditation will be. But if you're not inclined to meditation, it will serve you very well as a purification of your mental states on a more everyday, de-stressing, mundane level. And with that, I want to close this reflection on this step of the Buddhist development on this Buddhist path. And feel free to send comments, to ask questions, if it pertains to my field of expertise, and I will happily comment on them in the next video. Take care.